in all of the studies, fremenezumab, eftonezumab, ranumab, and galconezumab, in the population of patients studied, whether episodic or chronic, they separated from placebo effects within a week. They all showed meaningful clinical benefit within a month. There was not a titration necessary. Uh, all of them show reductions in mean monthly migraine days at, by the time a year elapses at really unprecedented levels. For example, in a placebo-controlled trial for a year with eptinezumab, 54% of the patients had, a, had at least a 75% reduction in their mean monthly migraine days at a year. So, th so that's a level of efficacy that we've never seen before, and it's a standard that we've never used before for our migraine medicines when we're talking about less than half having a 50% reduction. What was the reduction. therapeutic gain? I don't Here's remember. Here's the point. I would, I, you're absolutely correct. But we once did a study of an injectable neuroleptic, and our placebo response rate was 60%. And one of the things when we compare all of these antibodies is the following. When the efficacy is high, it shows the placebo response rate. But so it turns out, Steve, that the more previous preventive agents these patients have had, the lower their placebo response rate. I'm not disagreeing rate. with you. And the patients that were in these studies had multiple but what I'm saying to you, though, failures. is if you do the analyses and you compare every single monoclonal antibody, which I hate to say the word in public, ICER did, they're more alike than similar. And if you analyze the data and you compare it to, for example, to topiramid or botulinum toxin, they're very similar. What I, I, I think we need to realize is the following. Insurance companies are going to demand, and they do demand, that you fail two drugs before you get them, just like with Botox. Some are requiring three, some crazy people even require a triptan. So I don't think it's gonna be the older drugs versus the newer drugs. I think it's really gonna be, we have patients who are gonna to have to fail two of the older drugs, and we've got tons of patients like that, and we have a brand new therapeutic option which will work even if the old drugs don't work, yeah. and that's what's amazing. And interestingly enough, in the chronic migraine patients, it's almost, it's much about expectations. The chronic migraine placebo rates for the subcutaneous medicines for premonizumab, arenumab, um, galconizumab, the placebo rates are lower than the yeah. placebo rates in the Botox preempt trials or indeed in your yeah. chronic uh, migraine to pyramate study. And, and, and taken to with liberty this uh, study that shows that between two and four previous classes of failure have uh, lower placebo rate than the than the uh, than patients. If you look at the uh, broadly speaking, in the in patients who haven't had other treatments, it, what it, what really encourages me is clearly the people who need something, those who failed previous things, are the ones that are going to do really well. I mean, very that's, important. We were under in a high false, therapeutic game. We were yes, under the nice. false belief that failing other drugs would make a trial impossible. Yes. We now learn it's the opposite. Patients who fail more drugs have less placebo response rate, but they still respond, and you can separate from placebo easier. Let me challenge you on one thing. Sure. It's the business of therapeutic gain. Yes, I sir. think it's meaningless in clinical practice. I pay no You're attention to it whatsoever. absolutely correct. <laughs> I'm talking about clinical trial methodology. For example, the best drug I want is the drug with the placebo response rate. Right. In real, and that's the problem with the ICER analysis. They only look at the separation from active drugs from placebo, and more important than that, they assume it's like a cardiac medicine where you take it for 10 years and you gotta do it. If a patient doesn't respond to a migraine preventative medicine, they're gonna stop taking it. So it's not the entire population initially treated, it's only the responders. And in real life, what we care about is how well the patient does not how much it's placebo and how much is active drug. I just think the take home message for clinicians should be look at the magnitude of the response and use that to determine whether or not that's going to be meaningful to you and your patient. 100% correct. Because inevitably what happens is you not only mirror that magnitude of response, but you do better than it. The reason is you've taken placebo off the table, right? right? So the patient's not wondering, do I have a 50-50 chance of getting active or placebo, number one, and number two, um, you're doing more things for the patient. You're not just writing a prescription, right? So I think actually we do better in clinical practice than, than, than the results we get in clinical trials. So my, 
My, my advice to clinicians is use the magnitude of the response when you're determining clinical benefit and not look at 1.8 or 2.2 or 2.4 days in the difference. I that's agree not with you 100% and you and I have written the letters to ICER complaining about it. <laughs> but I, the only reason I brought up the therapeutic gain is if you look at all the antibodies um, in the absence of head-to-head -head trials, my only point was look at the difference in therapeutic gain. And that was the point. So you can't say one is better than the other. And no, yet, no, no. That's what I was using, David. Yeah. In real life, I don't care about therapeutic gain. In real life, I want to know how well my patients are going to do. So I, I want to say one thing about that, about what David just said. So this is, to, this is an, a, a request to my colleagues, my neurology colleagues. Look at the drop from baseline. So if one looks at patients who took arenumab for a year for chronic migraine, the drop from baseline was 10 migraine days per month. 10, day, 10 migraine days per month times 12 months. That's four months of no migraine per year that these patients got with arenumab who stayed on it for a year. And, the, and there are comparable numbers for the others. I'm not saying one is better than the other. But the magnitude of this effect is huge and I really believe is unprecedented. We're not disagreeing with you, I think, for two reasons. One, these shots are given, which means that compliance is up. Two, the side effect profile is wonderful. There's no disagreement about that. And I think that people who say to pyramid or beta blocker versus the antibody are missing the story because it's not one or the other. One is a precursor. Well, not only a precursor, but I want to bring up the point of layering. You have, going back to the chronic migraine patient, 50%, 60% reduction still leaves them an episodic migraineurs. There's a lot of days on there, and sometimes a single agent's not enough. And so we have evidence that in these trials that if we combine medications, that's safe, and that you can potentially get greater efficacy. So I think that's an important feature, that it's not... We only have new things, yes. we should only use new, but we should think about layering and combining different I methods. I think that's a good point. Of the majority of my patients and anybody are layered. Right. And I, I think so what I think what you're hearing today is these are wonderful new medicines. But like it's like an epileptic patient. They're on an anti epileptic drug, the seizure comes under control. You don't stop it, you layer. And I think that's where we're getting in migraine.